Hello, and welcome back to The Future Of. I'm your host, Jonathan Narvi. And once again, I'm excited to be here because I have a, uh, an expert guest, and we're going to be talking about um, cryptocurrency. We're going to be talking about digital payments, the future of, uh, and the future of this sector. Uh, and I'm speaking today with Brinley Lear, who is a leader in financial innovation. Uh, she is an impact evangelist. She is, she, she describes herself as a block changer. Uh, and she's a contributor to the World Economic Forum. Uh, before we get into uh, precisely, uh, before we get into this conversation in any depth, Brinley, uh, I'm gonna ask you to uh, provide a little bit more context. Why are you the exact person I should be speaking to about the future of cryptocurrency, financial services, digital payments. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, I think, aside from the fact that I am fun to talk with, which you will see, um, I have a lot of experience in this area and not just on the technology side, but from the legal side. So we are, we are talking about blockchain technology. We're talking about cryptocurrencies. I think you can't really begin to appreciate the importance of that technology unless you understand the landscape and, and where it sits in the world of payments and financial services. And all of that is um, highly tied with our regulations and uh, a, legal, a legal framing. So in many ways, I think a great way to understand and really think about this space is to look at it from the viewpoint of a lawyer. Well, that's a wonderful introduction. And uh, I think this may be the first time I've spoken to legal counsel on this particular topic. So this is going to be a, a new perspective on this. I'm delighted. All right. You're welcome. <laughs> so we're going to, you know, just to sort of set the table here for the discussion, um, you know, I, I see a lot of hype. Maybe this is fair or unfair uh, in the uh blockchain, uh, cryptocurrency, digital payment space. And, um, you know, I consider myself to be a, a fairly, uh, uh, you know, clear-eyed observer of the tech scene in general and, and various niches, but um, digital payments in particular, um, I, I, I sort of don't know what to make of it when I see, say, a, um, a tweet from Elon Musk about Bitcoin, or um, I, or I see the price of, uh, say, a cryptocurrency, maybe, maybe Ethereum or, or Bitcoin, uh, either skyrocketing or plummeting or skyrocketing again, and uh, you know, it's, it's seems like it's a, it's a speculative space, but then there's also genuine innovation going on in this space. And um, where do you see uh, the, this kind of technology, where's it at and where's it going? Can you sort of paint a picture? Sure, sure. And I think um, when you start with Bitcoin, I mean, I think there's a real difference between Bitcoin and the animal that that has become, and then this space more broadly and the innovation that it enables, right? And we're just at the beginning of that part of the journey, I think. Um, so Bitcoin is its own thing. It's been around for over a decade. Uh, it, it, came on the scene with, you know, just as an idea that it was a way to transact peer to peer without an intermediary. It was a way to solve for double spend. It was just that, but it was really an idea. Now it's caught on, it is still around, but that is not the full landscape of what is blockchain and cryptocurrency, right? So how you might feel about Bitcoin, I feel like that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about the innovation and why this actually matters. Um, when we look at where it's going and what's possible today, what this technology enables is uh, a way for people from across the world to transact directly with one another without having a full banking, this is just one example, without having a full banking infrastructure between them. And um, that's where when you talk about digital payments, that's where it actually becomes very exciting. And I would say if you hear about digital payments and you're like, eh, that doesn't seem that interesting, it might well be because of where you sit in the world, right? If I'm in the United States, uh, when I want to move money around, I have 
no fewer than 10 options available and they're all pretty easy, right? Financial services, as it turns out, you get great quality uh, and you pay a pretty good price the wealthier you are, right? But that's not true for many people around the world. And so when we think about use cases like remittance transfer, so that would be uh, workers in the United States sending money back home, whether that's to the Philippines or Mexico or any number of places, whole lives depend on these payments. And when you look at actually how these move, um, they're surprisingly expensive. They take a lot of time. And that doesn't need to be the only way that, that those payments are enabled. So when you talk about digital payments and not being interested about that, I get it, but it really depends on who you are. If you had a different profile and you were sending money to a foreign country on a, you know, a repeated basis, you might feel differently. Yeah, I think so. Just to be clear, it's it's not that I'm not interested in the subject. It's it's more that um, you know the I see the excitement in this area, and uh, I think you hit the nail on the head just now with um, you know look we do live in in North America and there's a ton of options. But on my last uh, call about this, we we touched on this as well. I was talking to someone who uh, was facilitating. Uh, digital payments, it, primarily, it, may, maybe not primarily, but a lot in Venezuela, where of course the currency is garbage, uh, and and people need to, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the fiat currency in in yeah, Venezuela, yeah. and 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 you know, people need a way to you know hold value when when the uh, fiat currency is inflating uh, every, every day. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's the equivalent of, you know, 1930s Germany where, uh, uh, you know, people are sort of paying for breakfast with a wheelbarrow full of cash. Uh, yeah. This is just not not a cool option. So uh, I totally understand. Actually, th this did, uh, again, this sort of came up on, on the previous talk about this is, Jonathan, this is maybe, yeah, maybe this is not a solution for you, but maybe this is a solution for lots of people who are not you. So yeah, it maybe you, go ahead. And when you think the currency is garbage, like, mm -hmm. yes, that is true. That happens mm -hmm. to be the case. It really mm -hmm. is garbage. You can go mm -hmm. uh, visit in areas around Venezuela and mm -hmm. you see things made from the, the fiat currency. You can see mm -hmm. bags and purses made from the boulevards, right? That's mm -hmm. how little value they have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's garbage, but it also, there is a real human tragedy. When I was visiting, I was visiting before the pandemic, uh, part of the team that I'm with now at C-Labs doing work on Cella, which is this decentralized blockchain. Um, part, of what into, part of what went into the technology is doing real life research. And so we were in Cartagena, Colombia, we were talking to Venezuelan refugees. Um, and just, we think about payments and it seems very, you know, blase here. But when you think about the real experience, if you worked an entire day, and this was now over a year ago, if you worked an entire day in Venezuela, you might make enough to buy one egg. One egg. How do you feed your family with that? I mean, the real human suffering was something. So you think about what this technology enables. And once you have a stable currency, which gets to some of your points, once you have a stable currency where people can transact, not just face-to-face -face, like you could with fiat cash and dollars, but across the world, and you have this possibility of even providing a choice in how you're holding value, that gets to something really transformative, I think. I mean, even going back to early economists and F.A. Hayek and this idea of you know, dual currencies, um, it gets really interesting, but I think you know we talk about technology, but there's a real human, there's a real human element here, I and mean, we were talking mm. about livelihoods. Yeah, and I see that you know your passion for this subject. I mean, it, you know, you're not just working in the space; you clearly have a, a strong passion for uh, this for this technology and the the social good it can do. Actually, w would you be maybe, maybe you could provide uh, maybe another example of you know, sort of digital currency and cryptocurrency for social good uh, in, in other contexts. Oh, for sure, for sure. So when we started the conversation, we were talking about Bitcoin and really not understanding, like, why is that a thing? Why is that so important? And I think maybe part of, and I'm going to get into answering your question, but let's just talk about Bitcoin for a minute because it's a nice entry point. You know, part of that skepticism is, well, would you ever use Bitcoin to buy a cup of coffee or pay your rent? And the answer is, 
No, it's way too volatile, right? It's way too volatile. So it's not really a currency as we think about it. It's not really a medium of exchange. So if we want to enable this technology to speed up the move of value so that people can use it, have a stable currency to pay their rent and to buy food and medicine, we need to think about stability first, right? You can't be putting a very volatile asset in someone's hands and expecting them to use it as currency. So one, we have to solve for volatility. We need to have stable assets. And that's really this next wave of cryptocurrencies. Now we're seeing more and more of these stable assets and it's powerful because that's what we can actually use in our day-to-day -day life. Okay, so once we have this introduction of stable assets, we can then think about technology that is enabled for most of the population of the world. And what is that? That's not a desktop computer. That is not a really complex system of hashes where you're going to keep your crypto value. That is actually using an inexpensive Android device, Android device, um, which is what most of the world uses, right? So if you then have a stable coin and you have this access point that is an Android phone, and this enables very fast payments that take seconds and cost very, very little, that may sound like a small thing, but it enables all different types of innovation. So let me give you uh, one example of an innovation, another example that is um, just an aid program. And I could throw in several others too, if you're interested. Um, so the first is micro work. So micro work is really interesting. Uh, there's a group that I work with, a company that I work with called Toka that is doing this work in Kenya. Now I also advise them separately. I really love this company. This is what they're doing. Um, what we would typically, uh, if you're a company that has a lot of data that needs to be sorted. So say you're a website and you're keeping track of all of these images and you need to know what is a boot and what is a shoe and what is something else. You're gonna be training that data. And what you could do is traditional Western model, you hire your workers, they come into an office, they sit in front of a desktop top computer for eight hours, they flag this data, you do quality control, they go home, they get paid two weeks later. Most of the world does not work that way, right? This idea that you might go to Kenya and say, I want you to show up someplace, stay for eight hours, and I'll pay you eventually, this is a non-starter. Plus, it's really excluding huge sections of the population, right? I mean, we've seen this in the U.S., whether or not we love this idea of a gig economy, we've sort of tipped into this population of, of people who may not want a traditional nine to five job. They wanna have flexibility. And that's true in other places in the world. So what do you do with micro work? It means that you can deliver work to people on demand. So say I am a mom in Kenya, I'm actually a mom in Oakland, but let's say I'm in Kenya because that's where the program is. My child is napping. I can pick up my mobile device, works on an Android phone. I can tag images. I can tag images and I can do work for 20 minutes, an hour. I don't know how long my kid will sleep. I didn't know then, I don't know now. Um, and then at the end of that process, I can be paid immediately for the work that I did. Now that is, that is a system that works for not only the population of workers, and what they're used to and how they work can also provide some other opportunities that may not be available. Um, but it's something that just was not available before we had something like a blockchain and before we had this system with stable currencies where you can pay someone on demand. Because if you went to try to make that payment to someone in Kenya today through traditional rails, that's a wire transfer. You might be paying 10% to make that happen. They might have to wait a day before they receive it. Um, it's not an easy process. It's certainly not five seconds or less. So that's one example of micro work, which I think is interesting. No, that's terrific. That, what, a, what a great answer because it sort of answers the question of not just how this is significant internationally and in areas where perhaps, um, you know, you've got different work cultures, diff different cultures, uh, period. Uh, and, you know, you, you want to tie into the way people are actually living. Uh, but also, you know, ties into trends here with sort of the, the rise of the gig economy and flexible work. And uh, so I, I can see how this enables that kind of activity. Yeah. Um, so fantastic. So it seems like this is clearly a technology that, uh, uh, you know, is arriving at 
uh, just the right time. It's sort of a conjunction of other uh, cultural and, and work trends. Um, so that sort of begs the question, where is this uh, heading? And, and uh, you know, it's maybe my, my question is, is really around, um, uh, you know, sort of when does the, the marketplace of, you know, all these providers of, of various uh, uh, either cryptocurrencies or, or cryptocurrency exchanges or uh, digital payments companies, um, do you foresee sort of a, a winnowing of, of the market and, you know, the, the uh, sort of the big winners uh, yeah. becoming very apparent and, and what happens when, when this marketplace matures? Yeah, there's, a, there's really interesting questions there. So one, you started with where are we now and where is it going? And I would say just like that micro work example, and that's just one example of many different projects that are happening right now. That to me reminds me of the early days of the internet when we didn't yet know what it was going to be used for. We had eBay on the scene in 1995. That was very early for using the internet to, to match up strangers for commerce, right? We didn't know that eBay would lead to things like Amazon, it would lead to things like Facebook, whether we like it or not, what the state that they're in now, but we didn't see that coming in 1995. It was all very new. So we look at these use cases, we're seeing what's working, but it's just the beginning. When we figure out what this technology really enables, I think we will all be surprised. I hope to be surprised. That's the fun of it. Um, you then asked, where is it, where do you see it going in terms of, will there be winners and losers? And I think that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I like the internet, we saw winners and losers. We said, you know, we saw Netscape early on. Netscape is not what we use today. You know, there's some complicating factors of antitrust and other things, maybe when play, but those early technologies are not necessarily who, who really uh, power our lives today, with the exception of eBay, right? Around in 1995, still around today. So we are, I mean, I think we can see a lot of, we will see a lot of changes in the industry. I think what is, interesting about this space is that as new projects come up, they can be very tailored to particular use cases. And that's interesting because you could have a whole blockchain that is just focused on something like the carbon credit market and environmental, um, you know, in keeping track of um, specifics on land, something very specific, right? So, when we see these different blockchains with specificity like stable coins or carbon credits, or maybe it's just for payments, or maybe it's a way to uh, empower decentralized applications, we're gonna see a lot more variation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be only one winner. I actually think that we're kind of creeping up into this world of uh, a, a level of sophistication with our devices that will ingest the different information we need from different chains, right? Almost like you have a smart wallet that will then keep track of your stable assets on this chain or your carbon credits on this chain. Um, I guess the headline here is, I don't see one winner or loser. I don't see a handful of winners or losers. And in fact, I would say that's probably not what we want to see because in this world of decentralized technologies, where you have multiple players on every chain, I think part of why that becomes important is because it is a counterpoint to concentrations of power itself, right? So do we wanna have this new internet and have five big companies that really control it? I would say if we've learned anything over the past decades, we probably don't want that. And probably we don't want a handful of winners or losers. We want, this technology to enable lots of innovation around the world without deep concentrations of, of power. I probably went on too long with that answer, but. No, that, that's terrific. Uh, I have to say, Brinley, you've opened my eyes to the possibilities of this kind of technology, sort of to, to lay it out there. Um, I think I had an impression that um, maybe, um, you know, financial markets, financial services, the low-hanging fruit was already had; it was done, and and that and that uh, you know digital the digital payment space 
cryptocurrency. This is here's here's you know a, a place for iterative uh, improvements, little, little changes. But you've really opened my eyes that this is uh, much. Th this has uh, much greater potential to uh, actually en enable us to change how we live, change how we work, change how we, uh, um, you know, at a very fundamental uh, level, uh, you know, find the freedom to do the things that we want to do um, and, and, you know, how we use our resources, either as a society or, or, or you know, probably more, uh, more commonly individually. Uh, so this is fantastic. I, I really appreciate your insights. Um, I, I think my, I had one other question around um, you know, uh, again, I'm coming at this from the outside and you're the inside uh, expert. What is the thing that no one is talking about or very few people are talking about when it comes to uh, um, digital currencies and cryptocurrency that uh, you think more people should be talking about? I think it is what we're talking about today. I mean, this is why I'm passionate about it. Let's talk about the use cases. Yeah. I think um, we're past the point of just talking about the intricacies of the technology. That is interesting, but it doesn't get me up in the morning. What gets me up in the morning is what is going to, what this technology will make possible. Um, so that, I mean, it is what we've talked about. This is what more people should be talking about. This is why it should resonate and be interesting. Um, and if we're not talking about this, I think we kind of miss the whole point of what this technology can do. Brindley Lear, I have really appreciated uh, all of your insights and, and really enjoyed talking with you about this. Uh, you are clearly the expert uh, in this area. And I, I would just uh, ask if people want to learn more about what you're up to, uh, um, and, and the organizations you work with, uh, where would they find, find you? Yeah, so the work I do now, mm -hmm. uh, it, you can find it on cello.org, C-E-L-O.org. Uh, that talks about this decentralized blockchain that I've talked about. Uh, it will give you information about the Alliance for Prosperity. These are a lot of these groups that are doing things like micro work and lending and universal basic income powered by this new technology. Um, and I would say, you know, I think you probably should talk to lawyers more often. I mean, it's fun, right? <laughs> it absolutely has been a blast. Brinley, I thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, to my audience, uh, you've been listening to The Future Of. We've been discussing uh, the future of digital payments, cryptocurrency, and finance with Brindley Lear. Um, and if you like what you've been listening to, what, what you've been uh, watching, well, um, no video this time, just the audio, um, then please subscribe. And um, I guess that's about it, folks. I will see you in the future.